Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 17. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's not a cold. It's not a cold. Uh, in my 20s, for a better part of a decade, I thought I had a chronic cold. Because uh, more days often than not, I'd wake up with a runny nose, a uh, bit of a, a sore throat. And then one day, finally, a friend said, Hey, have you ever gone to see an allergist? It just might be allergies. So I finally went, and actually, to my delight, I was very happy to discover that it wasn't a cold that I was struggling with for, you know, almost a decade, but it was allergies. Uh, and so something as simple over-the-counter as reactant became gold and, and just did wonders for my life. Now, I want you to catch uh, the principle here, the, the idea behind it, and maybe it wasn't with allergies, but you've had a similar experience in life where what you thought was the explanation for something all along actually end up not being the explanation. And you found and discovered the actual explanation for what was going on. Similarly, just to same principle, but just to jump to kind of a, another area of, of life then, there's a fellow named Tom Holland, and I'm just uh, in the middle of enjoying his book called Dominion. And uh, at some point in his life, he was a staunch atheist. Uh, and if I understand his story correctly, he's converted um, back to Christianity, and this book is all about recognizing, it's part of his journey, to recognize how the West, at least the West, and meaning the culture you and I live in, has truly, truly been built by Christianity, built on the ripple effects, the ongoing ripple, ripple effects of this one man, Jesus, in history, his 12 disciples, and then the early church, the New Testament, and all the ripple effects, and he came to a stark realization, even if he didn't believe in Jesus per se, to place faith in Jesus, functionally on the surface, in the world that he lived in, and his morals that he grew up with, that he didn't even realize, and outlook on life, he was more Christian than he realized, and was at that point uh, happy to admit. So, a uh, quick example. He speaks of human dignity, and human dignity is a big thing in our society and culture today, uh, one, you know, encouraging people to find themselves, speak their truth, to not um, look down on anybody. And so this notion of human dignity, I'll just read a quote from his book, that every human being possessed an equal dignity was not remotely self-evident a truth. A Roman would have laughed at it, meaning during Jesus' time, this was not the norm. And as the church had its ripple effects, this was not the norm. Excuse me here. Uh, to campaign against discrimination on the grounds of gender or sexuality, however, was to depend on large numbers of people sharing in a common assumption that everyone possessed an inherent worth. The origins of this principle, as Nietzsche, who's no friend of God, had so contemptuously pointed out, lay not in the French Revolution, nor in the Declaration of Independence, nor in the Enlightenment, but in the Bible. Okay? Now, it's not only him, but there are others like him. Uh, Bart Ehrman and other non-Christian historians who fully acknowledge the world we live in it's built by Christianity. And if you go down that path, 
with an honest investigation, you'll realize how much of our life, our society, is built actually on Christianity. Just having some technical difficulties here. So the, the first um, encouragement that I want to give you is this. First, Christ follower. Today, in this moment, persevere. Persevere in joyfully living out your Christian faith and influence. This was a huge encouragement for me, especially in the past few weeks as I've been getting into this book, because if I'm honest, in my own personal walk, I've kind of generally come to a place where I felt discouraged because when I look out, I feel like increasingly I'm living in a non-Christian world. And it's so hard to engage my friends, and if you're here today, any non-Christian friends, it's, it's hard to talk to you about Christianity and, and to, to get you to consider just the, from an internal perspective the all importance and significance of thinking about Jesus. But to the Christian, I want you to realize that you are in a wonderful train of countless number of Christians who have persevered in their witness through all the centuries since Jesus. And really, if you realize, it's mind-blowing how much of our world is actually, all the, any goodness you see out there, probably like just a, you know, off the top of my head, non-educated, unscientific number, like 90% of the goodness you see out there is somehow a ripple effect of Jesus and Christianity. So persevere. Persevere joyfully in continuing to live out your faith even in these times. And so the, the, the prayer that I hope will stir in your heart uh, as we consider Matthew chapter 5 and this third aspect of, of the vision of really Christ's vision for his church, I hope there's something that stirs in your heart as we spend time in God's word. Lord, help me to be your blessing, pointing with greatest hope to your new city. And if you're unsure what I mean by new city, we'll, we'll get into that. But the whole notion, keep persevering. Lord, help me to persevere in being your blessing, pointing with greatest hope that I would not give up hope in this grand picture of where we're headed as Christ followers. Just to recap a little bit, um, the first part of our vision, Jesus came to make us glad in his new culture of grace, meaning the gospel. The gospel, for sure, it's an act of God. It's a work of God to save our souls, to forgive, make a way to, for our sins to be forgiven. But then from there, it's a worldview. It, it's a new way of looking out on life through Jesus and his gospel and grace. And so we dream of a new culture replete with beautiful stories of lives and communities transformed and matured by God's grace in Jesus Christ. Next, that culture of grace, that new culture of grace is meant to overflow into more and more like-minded people gathering together. And so even this morning, this is evidence of God at work. We're a new community. We're, we're a, a group of people that are marching to a different drumbeat, to Christ's drumbeat. And so Christ came to make us belong in his new community of grace. And so we dream of a new community marked by growing Christ-likeness while on earth, and perfected in eternity. And then the third part, which we'll hone in on today, Jesus wants his people to signal forward. You need to see yourself as a signpost or a light post, and to signal forward, to point forward to eternity, to the hope of the new city. And so we look forward to the new city, and by the new city, that's just really what Jesus meant by the kingdom. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near. It's what Revelation speaks to in chapter 21 of the new Jerusalem, the new city coming down adorned as a bride ready for uh, her groom who is Jesus. It's the city without foundations, the eternal city that Hebrews speaks of that Abraham looked forward to. And that's why he left his motherland because he was pursuing that city of eternal foundations by faith. So another way we can do it, think of it, just in everyday terms, the new life. Doing life 
on a new earth in a new creation as God meant us to, even better than 1.0, version 1.0, after he comes to consummate history, to judge, and then to welcome his people to his good eternity. And so as we look forward to the new city in eternity, we earnestly pursue Jesus' vision of mercy, justice, and humanity as a signpost. Right? We, we need to keep living this out. And really, God has been so kind, I'm realizing in history, for Jesus and the ripple effects of Jesus and Christianity to bring so much goodness to this world in history. And so as a signpost to guide our temporary earthly cities and nations and so forth. So what I want to ask for the rest of our time together and now really getting to Matthew 5, how does Jesus want me to be his blessing? I hope you walk out of here today with some clear sense, a a to-do for yourself, a takeaway. Lord, I want to be your blessing and in a specific way. So first, I want you to see with me Jesus wants his people to gather and scatter. Jesus wants his people to gather and scatter. Now, where do we see that? What do we mean by that? Now, as we get into the passage, Jesus says, you, so first of all, notice you here is plural. Jesus wasn't speaking to his disciples here individually, but he was speaking to the collection of his disciples, the church. He's speaking to the body of his followers. So you, plural, There's the gather part, are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. Now salt and light, they have a few things in common. And Jesus, he's the master teacher. He knows exactly what he's doing. He never chooses a metaphor uh, whimsically. And so if you think about salt, I brought my salt shaker from from home here. And and you never go to the grocery store and just buy one grain of salt. (laughs) Salt, it just makes sense to us. It it comes in a pile. It comes in a bottle, a box. And so salt is is first meant to be together, but then the way it has effectiveness, it does need to be spread out. Light as well, if you think about it. I have a little flashlight here, and as I turn this on, this beam of light is composed of millions and millions of tiny single rays of light. And the way that light has effectiveness, brightness, potency is is many, many little tiny rays of light coming together to form a beam of light. And notice how Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So he's speaking to the church, plural, and we're meant to be together as much as possible. That's why all the more our vision for 2022, 2023, let's keep growing. Let's keep growing together. Let's, let's try as much as possible. Yes, everyone where you're at, we, there's grace to take the steps that, one step at a time that you need to, to come out of the, all the effects of the past two years. I hope we are a church that shows grace to wherever you're at and that, at your pace, but still always encouragingly nudging you along. But we, let, let's try to get back to as much as we can before COVID and to come together And so the way light is effective as well is as these rays of light come together, then it's projected out. It's scattered as well. So Jesus, he's intentional here in choosing salt and light. Now, more specifically, with salt, you are the salt of the earth. And that's where we get the English expression. He's a salt of the earth kind of person. She's a salt of the earth kind of soul. It's, again... I remember one time with one of my friends who hasn't placed faith in Jesus yet, but we read Mark together, and uh, he, he said, I, I asked, oh, so what's your first takeaway after reading Mark? It's like, oh my goodness, all these idioms and expressions that I just picked up in life, I didn't realize so many of them are from the Bible, right? Another way, just the ripple effects of Jesus in history. And so here, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? So one aspect being a common trait between salt and light having to be gathered, but then the way salt has its effectiveness for taste, it needs to be spread out, it needs to be sprinkled, light needs to be dispersed. If salt is not only to enhance flavor, but also salt was used during Jesus' time, we still use it today to preserve uh, meat and other things. 
It needs to be rubbed in. And so another common trait between salt and light that Jesus wants his people to uh, emulate is to really get close to what we're trying to affect. Salt needs to be rubbed in. Salt needs to be sprinkled on to get close to have its effect, whether it's to add flavor or to preserve. Light as well. It engages. It interacts. It has to get close to what it's trying to light up for it to have its effect. And so that's why Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And now he introduces another me- metaphor, a city. He compares the city to being this beautiful light, this beacon for the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's meant to be shown, to interact with what's out there, to engage what's dark out there so that it's lit up. And so you don't hide a, light, a lamp under a basket but you put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. And so Paris has a beautiful nickname, City of Light. There's something biblical about that. It's meant, in history, it became to be known as a city of ideas. And and at one point, the origin, King Louis uh, XIV, wanting to make the city a safer place. And so literally, he made residents put light in their windows and candles and oil lamps and And he innovated street lamps and so forth to make the city a safer place. But also later on, Paris being known as a city of many wonderful ideas. That's similar to what Jesus is getting at here. That as a church, the city he's speaking to is the church. We're meant to be almost like a new city within the existing city as we point to that final new city. And so, if you'll try to think of yourself as a light post. That's why our prayer today is, Lord, help me to be your blessing, pointing with greatest hope to your new city. And we're to light up a path to somewhere. Now, all the other good that has come about in history because of the influence of the ripple effects of Jesus and Christianity, they're wonderful. All the kindness towards uh, the poor, humanitarianism, and even innovation, and and scientific innovation, and so forth. You could really connect that, and even non-Christian historians do connect that all back to ripple effects of Christianity. But where we are to light up a path toward, the somewhere that we're supposed to light up a path toward most significantly is eternity. Not just to be a blessing, not just to in the metaphor of salt, to make this earth and our society more wonderful and and flavorful and and to preserve. As a quick side note, I do believe God has preserved the earth through the ripple effects of Jesus and Christianity. But even beyond that, what is more important than that is we're meant to light a path toward eternity. This is so important because humanity in general even you and me on our worst days as Christ followers, we still sometimes revert back to repeating the sin of Adam and Eve. If you had to distill Adam and Eve's sin and what brought the fall into God's creation, I think you could argue strongly one way to distill it down to the bottom line, they had a self-absorbed short-sightedness. Self-absorbed. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to be wise. They wanted to figure out life on their own. And it was symbolized in that fruit right in front of them. Short-sightedness. They just could not see beyond that fruit that represented everything that their self-absorbed selves wanted and coveted. And we continue to repeat that same sin. We, we, We keep falling back to that. And so the church, instead, being salt and light, we're called to point, continually remind ourselves, first of all, as we gather, and then to point others as well and to try to live this out as best as possible through the week to point humanity to the opposite of self-centered short-sightedness, which is Christ-centered eternal life. Okay? 
That, that would be the opposite of just the self-absorbed short-sightedness. Christ-centered. That God is the center of my life. His Son is the center of my life. And all of life, I want to figure out how it revolves around Him. And it's not just this life, but figuring out how this life somehow becomes a beautiful domino that falls into the Lord's eternal life. So we need to gather and scatter as salt and light with this perspective, this Christ-centered life. Now then, this latter half of the sermon is going to get very practical now. What does that really look like? Jesus wants his people to overflow and shine good works. The scattering part is, first of all, literally just to go about our everyday lives and to follow Christ and exert as much of our influence as we can as a Christ follower and working unto him and thinking of him and his values, his glory, as much as we can in all areas of life. But in that then, to very concretely overflow and shine good works. That's how we're to scatter. To literally go and live out your Christian faith in all areas of life. Where do we see this? Verse 16, he continues, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Because as the church, we're not meant to be hidden. We're meant to be on a stand and shining. And Jesus, he's speaking in a metaphor. And then he gets very concrete. Let your light shine before others. What does that mean, Jesus? So that they may see your good works. There it is, plain and simple. Straightforward reading of Scripture. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so to put it one way, first staying at the level of motive and character, the balancing act of Christianity is to do good works as an overflow of grace. Easier said than done. On one hand, Jesus is calling all of us, don't tire in trying to be a good person, to do good works. Now, if you're like me, I struggle with feeling some pride, 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 yeah, pride, when, I was about to say, feeling some proud, um, feeling proud or feeling pride um, when I do good works. And somehow my still maturing heart wants to take some of that glory. The balancing act of Christianity then is therefore not to stop, but to say, Lord, I want to keep doing good works, but keep maturing my heart that first in my heart, I would give glory to you. And if there's just natural, you know, uh, unawkward opportunity to even verbally somehow deflect that back to you without coming off as with false modesty and so forth, Help me to give glory to you. And if we're to pick up on Jesus' teaching, we can do good works in such a way that the actual natural response of even onlookers will be, why do you do that? And perhaps we could then explain, it's, it's because of Jesus in my life and what he's done for me and that they would give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Now, let, let me just kind of you know, if you're not getting it yet, let me try to just give you a little analogy. Um, last week, uh, maybe you received it too, a little pamphlet from the city of Toronto. And then I opened it and said, this little pamphlet has big savings or something like that. And it was the message that the city of Toronto is trying to become net zero as they're trying to become greener by 2040. And so there are just little to-dos, you know, Maybe you can change your energy source, your heating source, and so forth. And so the the call was to to really consider my choice of energy. And so the city has a goal to try to make our source of energy, you know, a certain thing by 2040. It's kind of the same idea. These good works, we want to keep asking God to, to mature us that our source of these good works, our motivation for these good works, would truly be his overflowing grace. And that's a lifelong journey. That's a lifelong process of of maturing. But that's the point. Jesus is calling us as he shines his light on us 
as he shines his light of grace and kindness and mercy and everything beautiful and good about and perfect about God, that that would become our energy source, so to speak, our, our motivation to keep doing good works. Now, Jesus, he goes on and he wants to really hammer this point home of good works. Because in verse 17, then he continues, and it's just a natural flow of thought. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. If you're unfamiliar what Jesus means by that, he means the Mosaic law. Basically the first five books of the Bible, you could um, generally say. And the prophets and the, the scriptures that speak to Israel's unfaithfulness in obeying God's law, how they broke covenant with God and pointing God's people back to God's law and what he requires of them. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't misunderstand me. I'm not giving you a ticket to licentiousness, to just live however you want. That's not grace. My grace, as you realize how much you've been loved and forgiven, it overflows then to a response of love. To love others as Christ has loved us. To, to act as in goodness and morals and so forth because of how Christ has sacrificed himself for us. And so Jesus, the next few verses, he, he hammers it home. I have not come to abolish these requirements of God, but to fulfill them. And so on one hand, this is good news, this is comforting. Jesus is saying, I get it. You're not going to be able to fulfill this. But in God's plan, because I'm perfectly human and divine, I have the ability to actually be the one person in history who will obey God's law. And look how Jesus describes it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot. Iota is basically like uh, the letter I. And so if you just translate it into everyday English, there will not be an I that is not dotted. You might have added, and a T that is not crossed. Meaning he will fulfill every single part of the law to perfection. But, he's still, on one hand he's saying, you can't do it, so I will. But he's still saying, that doesn't mean that you can't keep striving by God's grace, not out of your own work and energy and trying to earn God's salvation and forgiveness, but because you have been loved to keep pursuing, trying to become someone who obeys God's ways more and more from a joyful heart. And he makes it clear when he says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is profound. Jesus is saying on one hand, yeah, your, your salvation doesn't depend on your obedience and, and your record. Because look, even someone who doesn't get it all, they're still going to be in the kingdom, but they'll be the least. And so Jesus is saying clearly here, in just a master efficiency of words, your salvation does depend on your obedience, but at the same time, you're to keep growing and maturing in this as one who is in the kingdom. And so he says, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so to hammer it home, the clincher, and so he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. These were the people who were really trying to at least outwardly obey the law. And Jesus is saying, those guys who are making it their full-time job to try to be godly and holy, your righteousness actually has to be more than theirs. And so he says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're more righteous than them. Now again, Jesus here as a master teacher, he's saying two things at once. Not in opposition, but on one hand, you can't be righteous enough. You can't exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. No one can except me, and that's why we need Jesus. That's why it's such good news that he takes our place for us on the cross. But on the other hand, Jesus is also saying, but therefore don't give up. Keep persevering. 
make this a part of your life journey to keep wrestling with, God, how do I live out my faith? How do I be your blessing? So let's be clear. What is salvation not? It is not earned by our own merit. Let's make that absolutely clear for today. It is not physical health as well. Because we could think as we're trying to shine these good works, God, then you owe me. And so we want our lives to be more comfortable, our health to be perfect. Even everyone Jesus healed inevitably, eventually died. And physical health and healing and miracles, I believe, still happen today. But even if they happen today, and certainly they did through Jesus and his apostles back then, the whole point is it's a signpost. It, it's, it's a light post pointing to our hope in eternity. That one day we will receive fully healed, restored, young, resurrected, glorified bodies to live through in eternity in God's love. Salvation is not socio-political liberation. This is very important for today in our time of history where there are all these social justice movements. Now, I won't get into it, but even all the wonderful social justice movements or or the pursuit of those movements and and so forth, obviously we have to evaluate every movement to see what's good and, and, and off about it, but those are all ripple effects of Christianity as well. But what Jesus would have us understand is that just because, let's say, you help someone be less hungry, that doesn't save them. Yes, it's giving them a taste and picture of life as God wanted it to be before sin entered and hopefully becomes a sign to that wonderful good life in eternity. But even Jesus, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And so as we think of what it means to do good works, we have to remember, we have to be very clear, as we pursue these good works, the point isn't that we're trying to, in a man-made kind of way, create the kingdom here on earth. It's all meant to, as much good works as we shine, that it points forward. And certainly salvation is not just personal freedom with disregard and no regard for God's ways and his law. But then again, nevertheless, what is the fruit then? What's the fruit of genuine salvation? And Jesus says, let your good work shine. There has to be fruit. And Jesus says that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Meaning the law and prophets point us to the good works, the fruit of salvation we're supposed to bear. One of my favorite summaries of the law and the prophets, both, is from the prophet Micah. Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good. There's the word good, good works. What should be your good works? What is righteousness in God's eyes? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. So that's why it's important to remember, okay, salvation is not, say, socio-political liberation and doing justice and all that, but nevertheless, it's meant to be a fruit that we're meant to still somehow have influence on our circles and society and so forth as much as we can with the doors that God opens and to do justice, to love kindness, And bringing it back to where it all starts. Our energy source. To walk humbly with God. To stay in that sweet spot. I want to be motivated because I've been so humbled by God's amazing, undeserved love. Through Christ. So God requires this of us as a fruit. A genuine fruit. And so... Jesus said, or sorry, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So even Paul is agreeing, the Apostle Paul, as a response to the gospel, we're meant to, the way you prove it is to love your neighbor. 
I so appreciate how Jesus brings the final word on this and clarity in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 34. This is Jesus speaking a new commandment, like new culture, new community, new city, a new commandment in this new covenant of grace I give to you that you love one another, but now Jesus, he perfects it, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. You see the old covenant, the old law, love your neighbor as yourself, then you, the, the, the pitfall there, the slippery slope is that you just love people as you want to be loved. <laughs> and oftentimes, at least I know in marriage, that doesn't work. Because oftentimes the, the other person doesn't perhaps they have the same love language as you. What is a sure place is that you love the other as Christ has loved you. You love your neighbor as Christ has loved you. So what does the sum of the law look like through Trinity Grace Church? And of course, we are on the way. And I hope God uses this church beyond even my years to, and it will continually mature and God will protect this church to keep growing in genuine fruit of salvation. So what does it look like for us at Trinity Grace Church? Well, first, just to go back to some scriptures again, uh, we're convinced, as we look at scripture, that God certainly has a, a very special heart for certain people in our society. Deuteronomy chapter 10, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. Even here, it's the same principle as God has loved you, Israel, and saved you from slavery, you're to love others. It's that same principle now, just in gospel terms. So, for us, we want to never forget God's heart for widows, orphans, foreigners, the poor. And we're trying to shape our ministries, what we commit to, based on people groups and, and just people somehow connected to this. Of course, sort of in principle, as you kind of draw it out, widows can perhaps refer to single moms. They don't necessarily have to be old or young, but in those kind of difficult situations. Orphans, meaning the fatherless, those perhaps who are living in those single parent situations or without parents or a bit more abstractly, um, just people with deep emotional hurts and just looking to belong somewhere and needing the healing touch of, of Christ's family. For certain, we are trying to think of foreigners and, and the gospel taking it not only here in Toronto and to all the diaspora of the world that have uh, congregated here in Toronto, but also trying to, as a church, balance that with looking outward overseas and, and we need to continually wrestle with and hammer out what does it mean to love the poor in the name of Christ. So some practical ways that um, you can look forward to this year. Uh, hopefully by next Sunday uh, a sign will be ready and you'll see in the foyer something that will be new is a clothing drive sign and we'll have two black bins, uh, and there'll be, we'll send out an email of what items you can put in, but we have a volunteer at church who's committed every week to taking whatever's uh, donated and taking it down to a church um, in downtown Toronto in Regent Park, uh, or close to Regent Park, and uh, supporting a clothing drive that goes on there. That's going to become a regular thing at our church. I hope that you'll jump at the opportunity when it comes to support MET, men ending trafficking. One of the most important ways we partner with MET is through the Christmas banquet to just show a true Christian Christmas uh, to women who either have been freed from trafficking or are still caught in it. And some of them even have children and they're in this lifestyle or have come out of this lifestyle. We are striking up a new partnership for this year uh, with the Pregnancy Care Center. 
And as a church, we want to approach the issue of life in the womb and abortions as holistically as possible. Uh, to, to Meaning, the church also needs to do our part to provide support for those who are at the fork in the road of those very difficult uh, decisions. And so the Pregnancy Care Center really does uh, just a bang-up job of trying to come around women in these situations who feel helpless and doing their best to help them feel supported and provide all the, uh, from financial to emotional resources. Related to that, our next Lunch, Laugh, and Learn, uh, the director of Pregnancy Care Center will be coming to share uh, just more about our partnership and how we can partner. So uh, please look forward to that and, and try to make it out. Um, through the year, we're going to continue to provide new culture and new city seminars. Uh, these are to help equip us to become better in our verbal witness and how to share. So we're looking forward to Tactics Part 2. We had Tactics Part 1 last year or, or in the past two years, and uh, we're looking forward to Part 2 of, and just training and equipping to how to more effectively share uh, the gospel and have strike up conversations with our non-believing friends. Um, we're going to, as a church, and from the pulpit and so forth, the leadership, ongoingly challenge all of us, myself included, to build relationships with non-believers. Can't give up on that. I know some of us, myself included, go through dips of just feeling really discouraged. But we need to just keep persevering, persevering joyfully in building these relationships and praying for these friends and family. We're going to, this year, continue to figure out how to uh, really support and champion our effort towards unreached people groups and overseas workers. Next week, we have uh, just the, the bittersweet but mostly sweet joy of sending off a family. And they're heading to North Africa and wanting to support them and, and keep supporting them from Toronto as much as we can in whatever way. Something I'm excited about um, is just sort of a little bit of a rebranding of our Saturday morning prayer and just following Charles Spurgeon's uh, lead. He gave a tour of his church to some newcomers and then he said, and this is the furnace room. And then to their surprise, when he, op they, he opened the door, it was actually just people praying, intercessory prayer. And it was a metaphor for him that this is where the warmth and the life and the heat of the church emanates from. And so we want to invite you to come out as often as you can to our Saturday morning prayer where specifically we will be uh, praying for the work of God. And, and Jesus says, the disciples ask him, teach us to pray. And he says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. That's an intercessory prayer. And that will be the heart of the furnace room. Related to that, we want to invite, uh, sorry, just to backtrack again, um, to kick that off, we want to have a prayer walk through the immediate neighborhood here, the local Leaside neighborhood. And so just come here next Saturday, October 1st, 9 a.m. We'll have some Timmy's coffees and treats ready too. And, and we're just going to walk around the neighborhood and have a prayer walk and pray for this immediate community. We're going to uh, hopefully, as new communities start up, something that new communities could do together. Um, we'll give instructions on how to do it and let the groups figure it out, but maybe do a prayer walk through your new community's locale. And then uh, in two Saturdays, I, I believe the 15th or 14th, um, a prayer walk through Thorncliffe Park, we're planning that. Uh, just a, 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 right in our own backyard, but just a, such a center of foreigners and people who don't believe in Jesus Christ yet, but just to go about and, and just have a prayer walk there. Related to that, um, we're looking forward to this year, and this is really part of reaching out too, because uh, the, the Psalms, it, it accomplishes, it kills a few birds with one stone. We want to have a church-wide evening. That week, the new communities will be canceled, and we want to encourage as many of you to come out to here, 826 Eglinton, and it'll be an evening of Psalms, uh, just singing some Psalms, but these Psalms are prayers, and oftentimes they're intercessory prayers. They're prayers hoping in God's kingdom. And so, yeah, we'll be able to just kill a few birds with um, one stone there. 
And so we invite you out to that. And then something new for this year as well. Uh, let's keep growing building fund. Uh, if you've been with us um, past, uh, say, even a year or so, you'll know that this beautiful auditorium, um, it, it didn't look like this <laughs> some two years ago. And we went through some major renovations, and we continue to try to beautify the building as a reflection of uh, just the heart of God, the people of God, and making it an inviting place uh, as an LRT. I know it's delayed another year, but uh, and as condos go up and as con- Toronto continues to grow, we, our hope, we don't give up. We keep praying, Lord, may many people come to Christ through Trinity Grace Church. And, and so we want to make our building a place to warmly welcome outsiders as well. And so for the renovations that have happened, we've depleted the, the funds that we had set aside. And as we continue to beautify and modernize the building, um, we've dipped into our emergency fund uh, a little bit. And so first we want to replenish that emergency fund and uh, also to just build up more funds for future renovations that need to happen. And so, uh, especially for those who give uh, through Tidely, you'll begin to see Uh, We haven't uh, toggled it yet, but a Let's Keep Growing building fund. And so if you could overflow from what you're able to, to that fund as well, to keep building up this this structure to be a place to do God's work, that would be much appreciated. And so all that to say, Lord, help me. Help me to be your blessing pointing with greatest hope to your new city. And let me say a, a short closing prayer, and then um, we'll move on with our baptism. So Lord, pray for us. Help us to be your blessing, pointing with greatest hope to your new city. Lord, help each of us to um, respond I trust, Lord, that your spirit has been speaking to all of us here in some way. And so help us to respond and to overflow good works as a response to your grace, even as we do these things with the greatest hope in your kingdom come. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.